What camera brand has the best walk around kit for wildlife these days? We're talking about setups that give you at least 800 millimeter effective focal length at 20 megapixels so you can capture all those tiny little birds. This week we'll look at some great combos and the brands just might surprise you. So stay tuned. <laughs> So Yan, I see you're back from what looked like a really fun trip out into the outback just recently. It definitely was an interesting trip. It was fun at times and not so much fun at other times, <laughs> but it definitely always starts with a long drive if you want to go to the outback in Australia, because even to stay just within Queensland, we had to drive almost like a thousand miles or like 1600 kilometers. When I said it was a fun trip and you kind of were like almost hesitated. And isn't that the way sometimes these bird photography trips it's fun. In the end, it's like, it's what we're trying to do and get out there. But sometimes there's definitely moments of like discomfort or, you know, boredom or like long drives. Speaking of long drives, you know, I, one thing I always wonder about the Outback, I mean, it seems like once you get out there, there's literally nothing around for many, many kilometers. Do you have to take special kind of precautions when you're planning for those kinds of trips? Well, you definitely have to be well prepared. You have to have a reliable car. You have to take like at least two spare tires because one of our friends actually only had one spare tire and he blew that one spare tire and then you think one spare tire is enough until you actually blow one of your spare tires and you have no spare tire left and the next town might be two three hundred kilometers away so part of the trip we spent driving around trying to find another tire in the middle of the outback mm. and there's these little kind of like homesteads or stations they have a little bit of petrol they have some used tires so eventually we found one that kind of fit wasn't the perfect size but at least if something else happened there's nothing you can't get anything out there really and if you can it might take a week or two so it's definitely right. important to be prepared so i know you were well prepared what were some of the main bird species that you were after well it's a bit of a mix of things there's a few birds that i always want to photograph there major mitchell's cockatoos for instance they're just stunning and i never had like a intensive session with them so I always want more photos of them because they're just a spectacular bird and there's one parrot in particular that drives me crazy because I see it every time but I just can't get any photos which is that tiny little Burke's parrot and the challenge with them is that they're basically nocturnal like they show up half an hour before sunrise half an hour after sunset so whenever you think oh now I can't shoot anymore that's when the first Burke parrot mm. will show up so it can be quite frustrating and then in the rest of the trip, there was just, I just wanted to see those awesome like landscapes as well. And there's some different grass rents, for instance, we were trying to target, but that was a little bit difficult because there was pretty dry conditions. Of course, in the Outback, there's also a bunch of different cattle stations everywhere. And they have all these troughs and bores where they get water out of the ground for the cattle. So these can always be good spots because there's just permanent water. And so all the birds in the area get used mm -hmm. to those permanent water sources. But then you have to deal with some or a lot of cows sometimes that walk all around your perches and stand in your background. Yeah, that's uh, not something that you're used to having to uh, do cattle management to get out of the way. You need to work on your cattle calls or something like that next time you go. <laughs> so did you get any good shots that you're proud of after all that? I did get some shots in the end. You see that Major Mitchell flight shot there right behind me. And this was actually something that I quite enjoyed doing this trip. And that's a real sort of benefit of the new mirrorless cameras because it's actually so much easier to do flight shots now and on these kettle yeah. troughs it's actually easy as well because there's usually some sort of dead tree near them and then you put out a couple perches so it's kind of predictable which way the birds will come into the water as well and I had a lot of fun trying to capture all the different birds in flight and I basically managed to actually get a flight shot of almost all the species I was trying to photograph, like got some nice mulga parrots in flight, some Major Mitchell's cockatoos in flight, some galahs in flight, some mulga parrots in flight, so and some mallee ringnecks. So it was actually quite fun focusing on that a little bit more. And I always have to remind myself, because in the past, I was only focused on these perch shots. So I kind of always forget that now you can actually capture flight shots as well. Because with my 5D Mark IV, and I'm sure it was the same with your 7D, even if you kept a bird perfectly in the viewfinder, most of the time it was still not really in focus or sharp. It's a game changer when it comes to the mirrorless technology and of course also the much higher frame rates that gives you more potential images to pick from. Uh, with that said, I imagine you probably, if you're going for flight shots, you probably took quite a few images on this trip. 
Yes, I took over 18,000 images in total. I've deleted over 15,000 of them by now. So you definitely okay. go through a lot of shots shooting at 20 frames per second. And this is actually, I would have preferred the 40 frames per second from the R6 Mark II because you just get so much more poses from 40 yeah. frames per second than 20 frames per second. But irregardless, even with the 20 frames per second, it was quite good. And check out the Major Mitchell's Cockatoos. This was one of those birds where our pro sets are a real game changer as well. Because when you open them up in Adobe, they just look really yellow green and washed out and then one click vibrant more contrast and they actually look perfect so this was really helpful nice. in editing them and so this flight shot is another good example where you can see if you just lighten certain areas it makes the whole image pop you can see how the second wing was kind of a bit dark and the crest was a bit dark and just by individually brightening those areas the whole bird started to pop and really stand out from the background yeah, those are some great examples of just why it's so important to master those skills in the digital darkroom. And so whether it's by just those one click using our pro sets or learning some skills like Jan teaches in his masterclass videos or I do in my eBooks, it's so important that you learn those skills to get the absolute most out of your photos. And I'm also happy to report that I did finally get some Berg parrot images. It was a long battle. We stayed at a tiny little water trough kind of in the middle of nowhere on the last morning, for some reason, the birds, one flock of bird parrots actually came in much later than normal. They came in almost on sunrise. And so I was able to get some nice shots there. And we also found a few of the birds kind of hanging out just in the bushes just after sunrise, like over a bit of a hill. And so I managed to get some more shots there as well. And I was very stoked to get some images because they're pretty hard birds. They're actually quite pretty as well with all their pastel colors and their blue and that pink. Definitely. Well, it looks like it was a great trip overall. You got some nice new additions to your portfolio. So all in all, it was, uh, it was time well spent. So Glenn, I heard a concerning rumor that you have been fooling around with a different camera brand. <laughs> well, let me explain. That is true. <laughs> but here's the problem. So I've been wanting, or I'm always wanting, uh, a kind of wildlife kit that gives me enough focal length for birds, has all the autofocus characteristics that I'm after, but is kind of small and lightweight because often when I'm guiding, I kind of don't want to have the tripod and my 600 and everything. And so it'd be really nice to have. Now, the Canon R5 with the 100 or 500 is great, but it just sometimes isn't quite enough reach. So what I really am after is something that has sort of 800 to 900 millimeters effective focal length and like at least 20 megapixels, but it's not that easy to find. I think that's something that we all want and it's hard to come by. I got the R500 to 500 as well, but it is a little bit short sometimes. And then you add a 1.4 extender to get that extra reach, but you're wide open at F10 and then it slows everything down a bit. Or you have the fantastic R6 Mark II, but to get to like eight or 900 millimeters, you have to crop to like eight or nine megapixels. So with the 24 megapixels, that's a little bit difficult. And you've tried the R7 in the past, but I think that wasn't your favorite camera either. No, I mean, I feel like w what I wanted the R7 to be would have perhaps filled this, this niche. But unfortunately, I found the autofocus to be quite inconsistent and especially a lot of wobble in the images. And it just wasn't the camera for me. So it didn't, didn't take the box for me. And you've got like a Sony combo, like an A7 IV, for instance, or A7 R5 with the 200 to 600. The A7 R5 would probably tick that box, but it would make it quite expensive. And the A7 IV, mm -hmm. 33 megapixels, we could probably get away with that maybe, but then it only shoots at 10 frames per second, which for today's standard is very, very slow, I think. Yeah, and really, when you look at Nikon right now in their current lineup, they don't really have anything that really works here at all. They might be coming out with a 200 to 600 and maybe they're going to backfill their lineup and come up with a sort of a crop body or yeah. a high megapixel something. But right now that doesn't have what I need. So I had to go looking elsewhere. I had to go, I had to go somewhere else. And I thought, well, okay, the big three don't have what I need. So maybe one of the other brands has something that might be interesting. So what sort of combo intrigued you and you end up taking into the field with you? Well, Fuji was nice enough to send me this little kit. And so what we've got here is the Fuji HX2S. It's a mouthful. Took him like 10 times to say that. <laughs> the, um, the 150 to 600 millimeter lens, but this is a crop body guys. So it's at 26 megapixels, 
but it has a 1.5 crop. So really this is a 225 to 900 millimeter lens and you still have that 26 megapixels. So, I mean, that sounds really interesting. It looks really nice and light as well. From what I see, I think it's an internal zoom as well. So it just yep. looks like yeah, a really nice zoom. combo. And I know you're pretty strong, but would you say it's very hand holdable? It's definitely hand holdable. This has all the right elements for a really great walk around kit. And we'll get into it a little bit more here in a second, but it's relatively light. It's not that large either. I mean, it has a hood of course that you could yeah. put on. Um, but it's, it's sort of well balanced. The lens is slightly heavier than the Canon 100 to 500. Um, but by the time you put a body on it, it's, it's not significantly more. I know a lot of people always complain about the f7.1 on the Canon lens. This one I think is wide open at f8. Is that something that concerns you? Or do you feel like with the new ISO capabilities, that sort of aperture is actually good because it makes the lenses smaller and you can use the high ISO, you can use the or Pure Raw, you can use our process and the images will still be fine even at the higher ISOs. I think f8 is about as as small of an aperture as a maximum aperture that I'm comfortable with. Anything yeah. more than that, like the f11 lenses, that's a little too far for me, but I can work with f8. So how did you actually go with the camera in the field? I think it has a stacked sensor, so there shouldn't have been much or any rolling shutter. I think it shoots what, up to 40 frames per second, so it's super nice and fast. The specs sound intriguing, hand holdable, stacked sensor, 40 frames per second. Did you get some images and what did you think about it? I didn't experience really any rolling shutter with the shots that I was doing. So I took the camera out the other day and one of the first kind of birds or good fo photo opportunities that I found was of this Anna's hummingbird that was perching reliably in one spot. Oh, nice. And right away it was really nice. Yeah, it was really nice to have that extra focal length. Like I could right away tell, you know, considering I was using a, a smaller kit and I was like, oh, the bird is still a decent size in the frame. And so I was blasting away, taking some shots of him and, and, and overall things were looking pretty good. The viewfinder on the camera is really nice. So it's, it's got a, a great high resolution screen. Autofocus overall works pretty good. When I went out with it, I was actually out with my wife and she, I gave her my R5 and 100 or 500. And sometimes when you're using a camera, it's kind of a little bit subjective, right? Like, does this work yeah. better? Does this work better? So I decided in this particular case, because the bird kept coming back to the same perch that I, I was shooting with the Fuji system and then I would say, okay, hand me the, the Canon. And yeah. there's no question that the Canon system was locking onto the bird better. It, it knew what the bird was and it seemed stickier on the bird. So that was definitely, um, I guess my only kind of a little bit negative, I would say about this kit. Cause I love that I got a lot of megapixels on it. The files look really good. In fact, definitely less noise on the Fuji files than the Canon R5 files. Okay. And the, obviously that focal length was really nice. Like for example, if we look here in this image, here's what I'm talking about. I was shooting with the Fuji and the R5. So a big difference in the actual resolution when you're in the field and when you're trying to walk around. So a lot, a lot of good, good things to say about it. I still feel like they need to work a little bit on their eye detect and their their sort of AI autofocus. It works, it definitely works, but I found myself feeling like I still wanted the autofocus of the Canon, basically. Okay. Well, that's some awesome looking images and it seems like you had a good time of all with it in the field. Are you gonna add one to your bag or keep that one around? <laughs> Well, for me personally, I'm not going to keep this one. I think, you know, I'm pretty heavily invested in the Canon lineup and I have a 600 and I have a 100 or 500. So it would be quite an indulgence. And I also think that I do think that at some point, at least I hope that Canon's going to, you know, put out a camera that works for me in this way. Um, so for me, it's, this one's going to go back to Fuji, but it's not to say that I didn't enjoy using the camera. And we all know there's no harder task for any piece of equipment than trying to make its way into Glenn's camera bag. It's, it's a very sacred place, but it's a, who do you a <laughs> club? Who do you actually think this camera is suited for? Because it seems like it ticks almost all the boxes. Of, like, basically, the perfect yeah. walk around combo. Yeah, totally. Now, while this camera was not perfect for me, I do think that this camera is a very compelling kit for a lot of people out there. Basically, if you know that you're never going to get a big 500 or 600 millimeter f4 super telephoto, you're not the kind of photographer who really enjoys constantly having to use a tripod and a big lens. Who which does? Is <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. But some, you know, some of us are willing to do it and we'll do yeah. it. But some people just, that's just not you and you're not going to do that. 
all of a sudden, a kit like this is very compelling. You've got good enough image stabilization that you don't really need to use a tripod. You've got up to 900 millimeters of effective focal length. All in a kit that's less than $5,000, gives you great image quality, has that nice stacked sensor so you can take action shots, 40 frames a second, great video capabilities. It's very, very compelling for a lot of people. And honestly, I think if they can just take it one little notch further with the autofocus and just dial in those algorithms or whatever the heck's going on in there with the AI, I think this could be a real winner for a lot of photographers out there. It sounds pretty amazing. I mean, you almost sold me on it just there. But yeah. I think for a lot of people, as you say, that can't hold a heavy lens or don't want to hold a heavy lens, this seems like a fantastic combo. And there's obviously some other competitors in this space, like the Micro Four Thirds, like Olympus or Panasonic. And especially Olympus would be something we'd love to try out as well, but it's quite hard to get our hands on. But they're fantastic cameras as well with the two times crop of the Micro Four Thirds body. And they are small and light lenses. That's also very attracting, attractive in that kind of same range. And I think we're both excited to see more of these cameras coming onto the market going forward because for sure. it gives fantastic options for people. Definitely, yeah. We need to get our hands on some Olympus gear because neither of us have really played around with that brand's that brand's equipment. And yeah, I I think whether it's whether it's other cameras like this one or or whether Canon and Nikon and Sony just keep raising the megapixels in the cameras, there's going to be more potential for more capable walk around kits coming our way, I think, I hope. So we'll see. Well, now it's time for everybody's favorite segment, the photo of the week. So thank you everyone who hashtagged their images on Instagram with the hashtag bird photo show. We've got thousands more images this week to go through. And Jan and I have picked a few that just stood out to us. So this first one that I've brought for us this week is by Jin Chow Explore Nature. And it looks like he's down in California. He's got this beautiful screech owl. I love this shot because it's sort of this more environmental image. It's not super, super, super tight on the bird. It's got this mm. wider perspective, but the cute little owl sticking its head out and the perch is like really actually quite appealing. That big yeah. opening covered in moss. I really like this image. I think it's composed really well. What do you think, Jan? I think it's fantastic. I think I'd even want to see more of that log. So I think like a vertical shot of this image mm. could work really well as well. Or the classic four by five Instagram to even give us a bit more at the top and the bottom. And the only other thing I would change is there's this one bright spot in sort of the top of the frame there that kind of yeah. always makes me look towards it. So if I just brush something over that, I think it would put more focus on the oval, bad oval and fantastic image. And that's a, this is a good point you raise. And I, I definitely, um, my eye was drawn to that bright spot in the background. One thing, one good tip I think for everyone when they're editing their images is basically when you think you're done, when you're ready to hit save, or maybe you've already hit save, but before you close that file and move on to the next file you're gonna edit, have a, just a scan around the mm. image. Is there any little stick sticking into the corner? Is there any kind of bright spot? Is there maybe some tonal adjustments you might still wanna make before you finish off? But there's if there's something that's obvious after you kind of zoom back out and because you can get so focused on just the process that you kind of forget to look for these anomalies in the image so maybe just a little little tip for everybody out there. see here's something that i like to do as well when i'm editing my images i constantly zoom in and out when i'm in photoshop i don't know if you do that or not but sometimes something oh, looks sure. good when it's big but when you zoom it out make it image really small on your screen you suddenly see something that stands out or doesn't work as well so i'm actually constantly scrolling on a mouse wheel on my in photoshop when i'm editing zooming in and out because it just gives you very different perspectives of the image and often shows you what might need changing still there we go some good tips all right Jan what's your first image this week yes there was one image that stood out to me right away I love parrots and this is a pretty cool looking golden plume parakeet and I just like the post of it for the sake of keeping this episode short I will try not to pronounce the username because I think <laughs> that will be a bit of a challenge for me but Overall, I thought this image looked really nice, beautiful pose, nice colors. And the only thing I would change is probably that out of focus branch right behind that head that could probably go because it really doesn't add anything to the image in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I knew I knew as soon as you said, the only thing you guys knew at home too what Jan was <laughs> going like, to say. Oh, not again. Obviously, 
<laughs> yeah, obviously that branch, not ideal, especially coming through the bird's head. Overall, a very nice image. I know the species, this where this image was taken was in Colombia, but this bird is all through the Andes, the high Andes especially. And uh, it's a beautiful shot of this bird. They're not easy to get these, these golden plume mm. parakeets. Um, they're often, you see them flying over and stuff. So getting one down low is obviously feeding on this, on this foliage. So a really nice yeah. shot overall. All right, my second image this week is from the Oz birder, and it's of this red-winged parrot. A very beautiful species of parrot here. And, you know, it's a, it's a nicely composed image, um, shows the bird off well. The perch is, I don't know, I'm kind of torn on the perch. The main part of the perch is pretty boring, but then there's a few other kind of little sprigs, yeah. so it's got a little something-something going on. And overall, I just think it's, it's a very nice image to look at, and I definitely hope sometime to be able to photograph this species. Yes, I agree. It's a beautiful image. It's a nice pose of the bird. You see all the colors. You see the nice tail. The perch, as you say, it's not the greatest, but it's also nice because it shows it's in its environment, how it's feeding. So I think it's all around a really nice image. I think, if anything, it seems to be taken in the shade and it has a slightly blue cast, especially sort of on the bird. So if this was mine. I'd probably pump the red a little bit and add a little bit more warmth to it. But overall, a fantastic looking image. The next image I brought is of this totally crazy looking bird i mean you sometimes have to wonder if this is actually one of those crazy ai creations because that almost doesn't look like a real bird to me um and i just thought it was so cool i liked all the different colors in this image and just how the dead leaves on that plant also match the colors of the birds and the background kind of makes it stand out nicely and for some reason i wouldn't even clone out anything on this shot <laughs> What a shocker. No, yeah, I really like it too. I think this is a good example of um, an image where there's a fair bit going on, but it all works with the frame. Even those little vines that are kind of wrapping around the main mm. stalk that he's perched on are actually adding to the image. So overall, it's a really good perch. It's a super cool bird. Nice pose, kind of, I don't know if he's calling or chewing or what's going on there. But overall, a really nice shot by Kamal Harimenon. So what's the last image you're going to enlighten us with this week, Glenn? <laughs> well, the last one that I brought is of this beautiful blue throat. This is a bird I've actually seen and photographed up in Nome, Alaska. It's a, it's, this is a, not a common North American bird. You can only kind of get it up in parts of Alaska. But I, as I understand it, it's quite common throughout much of Europe and Asia, these blue throats. But yeah. a beautiful species, a nice singing pose. It's perched on some kind of berry. I don't know exactly what, some kind of blackberry or raspberry or who knows what kind of berries they have up in the yeah. Netherlands. But anyways, it's a nice looking perch. I wouldn't mind. It's ideally, it'd be nice if there was even a few more of those little leaves on the perch, maybe maybe up above the bird. But yeah. overall, I think it's a really nice, it's a really nice calling pose. Makes me think of spring with the buds just kind of coming out and the birds singing. So that's why I picked it this week. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. Great pose, great colors. I agree if there was more leaves, even better, but we can't always influence that. And I think, the ones you have over there have like a red star on the throat, whereas all the ones okay. in Europe have like a, a white sort of star or there's some that have no no sort of dot on the throat at all. So yeah, pretty cool birds. All right, Jan, what's your last image you've got for us this week? So my last image is of this beautiful little red cap robin. And what stood out to me in this shot is just a interesting pose. It's an all right perch with a nice background but it's this really sort of interesting curious pose of the bird you can see it just hopped onto the edge there kind of looking around of its habitat and i just thought it was a very nice shot overall by stuart melton would you prefer the crop a little tighter for the gram do you think possibly it's difficult with this perch because if you crop in too tight then it will probably make the perch look even chunky i mean this is somewhere where you could try my liquefying trick as well just push mm. in that perch a little bit to take out a slight bit of that chunkiness. But yes, I think you could maybe have a tiny bit more space behind the bird and a little bit tighter overall to just make it pop a little bit more. Yeah, I think I'd crop this guy a little bit tighter. And um, I don't know if this was a setup or not, but if it was, I probably, I'm never that keen on super horizontal perches in the frame. So if this was a setup, then I probably would try to kind of get a little bit of angle on that perch the next time you're out there, Stuart. But overall, a really nice shot, super cool bird, and uh, one to be proud of. And because if you angle your perch upwards, it's also quite likely that the bird will actually hop all the way to the end rather than sitting just before the end. And you might even get a really nice pose at the end of the perch. For sure. 
All right, guys. Well, that just about does it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you picked up some new tips. Maybe you're looking for a walk around kit and we've inspired you to go check out Fuji or see what else might be out there. But overall, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Totally. And let us know if you have already found the perfect walk around kit down the inner comments. We'd love to hear what all of you guys are using. And like always, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you very soon. Bye. See you next time, guys.